Well, hello, friends, and welcome to our time of prayer and scripture together. Pro-Life leader Frank Pavone here. Feel free to leave your prayer intentions in the comments. We're going to delve into the Word of God as we always do. We're going to uh, seek His face and intercede for one another and uh, strengthen our pro-life commitment. Today, speaking of pro-life, I'm in Washington, D.C., leading a, a board meeting of the National Pro-Life Religious Council. Members from many different denominations, I serve as president of that group. We're having our quarterly meeting, and then we're having a quarterly uh, reception in the evening for national pro-life leaders, and the next day, tomorrow, a uh, full-day meeting of those national leaders that I coordinate each quarter. So, great days uh, this week in Washington. Let's delve into the presence of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, we seek your face. It is there... And there alone that we find peace, contentment, victory over evil, salvation. Lord, we don't seek anything for ourselves. We seek your face. We ask forgiveness for our sins. We simply ask grace to serve you the way you call us to do. And we ask for an end to abortion. And in this study of Scripture, may we understand your word more deeply live it more faithfully, and proclaim it more effectively through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our reading is from the Gospel according to Mark. Jesus and his disciples left from there and began a journey through Galilee, but he did not wish anyone to know about it. He was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is to be handed over to men, and they will kill him. And three days after his death, the Son of Man will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to question him. They came to Capernaum, and once inside the house, he began to ask them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they remained silent. For they had been discussing among themselves on the way who was the greatest. Then he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone wishes to be first, he shall be the last of all and the servant of all. Taking a child, he placed the child in their midst, and putting his arms around it, he said to them, Whoever receives one child such as this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me but the one who sent me. Brothers and sisters, we who are in the great movement that we call the pro-life movement are defending children. This is our passage here of Scripture. He who receives a child receives God. Now, we're not demanding the right to create a child. A child is not the result of a test tube intervention or a scientific laboratory experiment or procedure. A child is a gift. And that means the child is to be received gratefully. Jesus uses the word received here. A child obviously cannot be discarded. That's what abortion does, and we're totally against that. You can't discard the child. But neither can you demand the child. The child is a gift to be received. You can pray for the gift, and certainly we pray for those who suffer from infertility that they might have that gift. Over the years, I've given many blessings to couples who were infertile and wanted to have a child, and often they did end up coming back with the joyful news that they were pregnant. But the, the bottom line is that the child is a gift from God. God decides when and if that child will come into existence. And so our part is to value and to welcome that child, to receive the child. I've talked to you before about how the, 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 the Planned Parenthood saying every child, a wanted child, is off base. Because wantedness depends on the will, desires, plans, and whims of somebody else. We welcome, or as Jesus says here, receive the child. What that indicates is that we recognize that the child has value in and of him or herself, not because it's granted by a parent or a court, a government, or anybody, 
The child has value given from God. Our duty is to make room for that child when, in fact, the child is in existence. Receive the child in my name. Now, why is this the case that the child is so representative of the kingdom of God? You know, the child is, first of all, completely dependent, right? I mean, we, as we go on in life, we take on the appearance of independence or relative independence. I'll take care of myself. And certainly, as life goes on, we grow in many ways less dependent on parents, less dependent on uh, certain structures in our life, like when we were going to school, we relied on the school to teach us. Then hopefully we learn how to learn on our own. We become in certain ways more independent. Although at the end of life, then we start to move more into a dependence again if uh, age, weakness, illness uh, it brings that about. But it's, it's only an appearance because what the value is of welcoming the child, and Jesus putting so much emphasis on children as the very sign of God's kingdom, is that their dependence more truly represents our situation throughout life. You see what I'm saying? The independence that we gain as we grow older, in a sense, it's an illusion. I mean, there is a a certain degree of independence, but it never replaces the dependence we have at every moment upon God for our very existence. That never goes away, that dependence. And that's why the child is so valuable. Because the child reminds us, no matter how independent in the eyes of ourselves or the world we might be, there is a dependence on God that is real and absolute at every moment. If God stopped thinking about you for one moment, you'd go out of existence. It's because of God that we can draw every breath have every heartbeat, that every cell of our body can continue in existence. We are totally dependent on God at every instant. A child reminds us of that dependence. Here's the other thing a child reminds us of. That love is unmerited. Now, what did the child do to receive your love, your cuddles, your kisses, your caresses, your smiles, your welcome? child didn't do anything. Child's not capable of doing anything to earn money or build relationships. The child is just there completely dependent. And therefore, the love that the child gives, or rather receives, the love, the love that the child gets is unmerited, right? It's coming from our initiative to love that child, not from something the child has earned. Now, again, as life goes on and we grow up, you know, we... We work, we make a salary, we, we do things for people, and then they feel they need to do something in return most of the time. And so what happens is, again, just like with independence, we get a certain feel, we create a certain impression, and there's some degree of truth to it, but again, again, the degree to which is true is really overblown, and it becomes somewhat of an illusion that we are meriting the love and the goodness that is shown to us by other people. Sure, sure, people may be grateful for things we did for them or in their lives. But brothers and sisters, again, the child is the best representative, the best symbol of something that's true throughout life, which is the love we have each day is truly unmerited. The love we receive from God, unmerited. He doesn't owe us anything, and we are not capable of earning His love. We are sinners. We are nothing without Him. He gave us our very existence. How can can He possibly owe us anything? We owe everything to Him. And the child reminds us of that. So the child, both in terms of the fact that he or she receives unmerited love and is completely dependent, is a lesson for us about how it really is at every step of life, especially in relation to God.
Brothers and sisters, let's welcome the child. The pro-life movement is putting the emphasis exactly where Jesus puts it. You welcome this child, you welcome me. You see this child, you see the kingdom of God. You love this child, you are learning about yourself and about your own relationship with the Lord Almighty. Let's pray. Father, make us like children. May we resist in this world the tendency to cast children away. May we resist on this earth, Lord God, the throwaway culture. May we resist the the legal framework that regards children as non-persons. May we oppose the mindset and industry of abortion. Father, help us. These words speak to the depths of our souls. We are to receive the child, not demand, not discard, but gratefully receive as a gift that human life that so represents your love for us. Give us victory, Lord, as we seek to save lives. Give protection to those children in the womb. And bless the pro-life movement with your grace, joy, and success. And now we lift up each other in prayer. We remember all the prayer intentions being expressed. We lift up those that remain in our hearts, and we do so by offering the prayer Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. So again, friends, pray for the leaders today who are gathering with me in Washington, the National Pro-Life Religious Council, and then the gathering, quarterly gathering of pro-life leaders that will start tonight with a reception. Uh, it's so great for us in the leadership of the pro-life movement to come together. It's so essential. Pray that that unity will continue to grow stronger. And we'll talk to you tomorrow. Music